I'm delighted now to be able to talk to you and the Dominican sisters, particularly who will figure prominently in my um, lecture today. So we have already seen the reliquary that Reiner said, and it was supposed, he suggested quite rightly, that it might have come from Spain or Portugal, but also there is a possibility that it came actually from Flanders or Spanish Netherlands, because in 1717, a colony was established from Galway in Dublin, and two sisters, Mary and Catherine Plunkett, left Galway for the house of the English Dominican nuns in Brussels, which is still there. So, and since this was just the year before the reliquary here, got um, fashioned, it is interesting, there seems to have been an interest in heads with the Dominicans, <laughs> because the year before, in 1722, one of these Plunkett sisters, a grandniece, returned from Brussels to Drogheda to found the Dominican convent of which we had just here, allegedly carrying the head of the martyr with her. But in the meantime, after he had been drunk, Drawn, drawn, no, what? Hung, drawn, hung, drawn, hung, drawn, and quartered. Um, <clears throat> his head had been brought to a monastery in Germany and then onto Rome. And then how it came back from Rome via Flanders to Drogheda, we don't know. But just looking at this, I much prefer our reliquary to this one. <laughs> so that would all have happened at the time of the Emperor Charles V, um, where Austria and Spain and the Spanish Netherlands were joined together. And there would have been a movement of all kinds of things, including reliquaries between all those areas. <clears throat> in fact, um, uh, Charles was born in, in Brussels, and I can just see Damien. Um, changed my PowerPoint, it, it was the wrong thing. And the circle is not, circle should be now Brussels and Cologne and not somewhere down in Switzerland. Um, so you can just imagine. So there would have been the connection between the Rhineland, Cologne, Spanish, Netherlands, Flanders, Spain, where the Dominican sisters had various houses in Bilbao in Santander, and I believe in Balia de Lid. And I didn't want to remind Galway people of the famous story in Balia de Lid, where James Blake is supposed to have poisoned Hugh O'Donnell, the famous one. And well, now they found out, however, as you might have heard, it was in the Irish Times, that they think they have found Red Hugh O'Donnell's skeleton in the bank somewhere, in, not on, under. A, a, and they said it should be easy to identify him because when he fled uh, via the Wicklow Mountains, he lost three toes to frostbites. So if there is a skeleton missing three toes, it's him. So as Pordic, who was in his student days in Valladolid, tells me that they're still the two most famous families there, the Blakes and the O'Donnells. So we could go back to that. So when um, Charles V in this charming portrait here was ruling from Austria to Spain, there was already a devotion to St. Ursula in the Spanish Netherlands where he grew up, as can be seen by this shrine, which is now in Brugge or Bruges, um, by, uh, made by Hans Memling in 1489 another shrine reliquary with the scenes of the martyrdom of St. Ursula, which I will show you some pictures later. And then from there on, um, the unstoppable march of the 11,000 virgins went from Flanders, from the Rhineland to Spain. And the monastery of Elas Escarial had or has seven head reliquaries in Spain alone. And this is one of the um, companions of St. Ursula. And as you see, they went to great trouble to make them look nice and uh, 
and especially um, their expensive clothing and their jewelry. And of course, they would have all been aristocratic uh, women who were interested in this and in the things. So when our last month or when our children gave us a trip to Tarragona in Catalonia, which Ryanair calls Barcelona, we is 10, <laughs> 10 minutes from the airport. We specifically went into the cathedral because it was said in the book that they had a chapel dedicated to St. Ursula with the head reliquary, the skull of St. Ursula. <laughs> so since we all know that's in Galway, we went there and the head is gone, the chapel is gone because the Napoleonic soldiers, the French, pillaged everything. So the French are to the Spanish and the Germans is what Cromwell was to, to Ireland. Anything that's missing is down to Cromwell or the French. So anyhow, now we, we still know it's, it's just here. So now we have to go to the origin of the legend of St. Ursula and Cologne Cathedral. And um, I grew up in the Rhineland near Cologne, so it was to me always um, a kind of a symbol. And it was only afterwards that I actually got more interested in the history. But as you can see, in 1945, Cologne looked like this. It was the first bombardment by the Royal Air Force in World War II. And at the end of the war, the population was reduced by 95%. But the, there are two things, as I always joke, one should never build a Gothic cathedral next to a railway station, <laughs> as it is here. It was, of course, so um, infrastructurally important because it was at the Rhine. There was this bridge going across, which goes back to the Romans, and there was the railway station. So it was a target. But as I've since found out, there was actually a letter of agreement amongst the, the people in the war, the English, the Germans, and for not to, they had a list of sites not to bomb, like a World Heritage site. And the way it looks here on this list was the cathedral, because everything else around is smashed to pieces, and the cathedral survived mainly except they had already got rid, taken away the windows mainly and so on. So to my mind, whoever drew up the list had an interest in Gothic architecture, as we can see, sadly not in the Romanesque churches, which were all around the cathedral. So where the blue, blue circle there is, that's the cathedral. Right on top of it is the church of St. Ursula. Underneath is the Monastery of St. Martin, I will tell you in a minute, and towards the west is the monastery dedicated to St. Gerion the Martyrs. You can see there, this thing is the Roman wall, and some of the monasteries are located outside the Roman wall because Romans didn't bury within the city. So you know from Rome, Via Pia and so on, there would be outside. So that is important for us as we go. All the churches, including this one, the, uh, the church of St. Martin on the left, which was ruled by Irish abbots in the 11th century. And it was from there that Christ Church Cathedral in Dublin was founded. And the two first bishops of Christ Church had been Irish monks in Cologne, as Rhinel and Portig have shown in many publications. But that church looked in 1945 like this too. And they decided, the city council, do we need that many churches? Do we restore them? We have the cathedral. But a private company called um, Friends of Romanesque Churches got together and between them, one after another was restored, including St. Ursula, as we will see. And what was more, 
since they were all in bits already, they could bring in the archaeologists to excavate before they're restored. So we have actually good um, records of, of the building history. So I was telling you about the one of St. Gerion. He was one of the marchers of the Theban Legion, a legion that um, came from Thebes in Egypt, a Roman from the Roman times, and who all wanted to um, become Christians, and uh, were then all had to put, they courageously offered their necks to the sword of the Romans. So 318 of the companions of St. Gerion were decapitated, allegedly there. So they built a church on it in the fourth century, and they prided themselves of having 319 heads and bodies and bones, and they were very proud of themselves. So then they were in the history as it went on, they wrote the passion of these people, and they gave them all names. And one of them, you'll be glad to hear, is called St. Brendan. <laughs> they were getting desperate for names. <laughs> so they were looking through all the, the, the calendars and the, the things. So anyhow, that was then the, one of the main churches in Cologne. Martyrs are always better than normal people, you know and they had all these bones, but they were um, out-thwarted, as I will show you, by the women nuns of St. Ursula. Yeah. So St. Ursula, a Romanist church, equally was bombed, and they um, restored then the Gothic uh, nave that you can see there, and that's always a sign if they have enough money to build such a big Gothic thing, it must be because pilgrims are bringing money there. And that's their story that we will hear now. You only have to go inside and you see already the boat here and the boat sets us off because on the, the ruins of an ancient church, there was supposed to have been St. Ursula with her 11,000 virgins, which were all martyred. And the men, the canons in St. Gerion, with their miserable 349 <laughs> martyrs, had nothing to, to match these women. So in the 9th, 10th century, eventually, the legend started. And this was, um, I will tell you how it was, a pagan prince had come from the north to ask to marry Ursula, the daughter of the king of Britannia, but she wanted three years pre reprieve before the wedding. She has requested 11 ships on which to carry herself around, and on every ship should be 10,000, no, 1,000, 1,000, made servants, women, who would look after those, one of the, the 11 um, who were running the ship. So all they did apparently was cruising up and down the channel <laughs> for a year or two until it was said, thanks to a favorable wind, they were blown over to the continent, went up to the River Rhine and arrived in Cologne. When they arrived in the Cologne, an angel appeared to St. Ursula to tell her to carry on to Rome, take the boat as f down up Rhine as far as Basel in Switzerland, walk over the Alps, meet the Pope, all of them get baptized. They mustn't have been baptized yet. Come back, bring back the Pope, bring back the Bishop of whatever, a couple of men here, a couple of children there, come to back to Cologne to be martyred there. She thought that's a great idea because obviously the best thing you could get is martyrdom. So they came back to Cologne. Uh, they were the Huns. The Huns are always the bad ones. Now they're just up there with Cromwell. The Huns were attacking Cologne. They were delighted when they saw all these 11,000 and each and every one got the head chopped off, um, except um, Ursula, 
who was so pretty that the, the Hans leader was overcome by her beauty and offered her his hand, but she refused and she was transfixed by an arrow. So twice she refused to marry, and the third time the arrow went through her, head, through her heart and she became a bride of Christ. So this scenario tempted every painter that there ever was. You couldn't get better than all these handsome maidens. This is by Caravaggio, and you can see it in Naples. And I can show, I'll show you more pictures. I had to control myself. I could have been here for weeks showing you pictures of um, cut-off heads. But uh, there would be a merit in a project not only to, to trace the Dominican sisters in an, on the continent, um, but also the cult of St. Ursula that you're now tied in with. So there are these places where they have the paintings, there are these places where they have relics, and it would be a wonderful map um, where you could put red for relic or you know push buttons. So if you have nothing else to do, uh, in, um, so anyhow, they were all dead, 11,000 plus one, but they were the hon, sorry? What year is that related to Allegedly. Um, 300 something or 400 something. It, uh, yeah, I mean, they were pagans um, still at that stage. So they tied in with the, the Theban Legion, you know, the late antique when the Roman army, the Roman world, and the first Christians being martyred. Mm -hmm. So they tied in with the martyrs in Rome or in elsewhere. So, um, of course, we don't know when or what, because the story, obviously, we can't believe. So you could go around um, searching for paintings of, of Ursula. But as it happened, then the Huns got a bad conscience. Um, they retreated, and the, the whole of Cologne was saved from the Huns, and the Ursula and her companions together with Gerion, became the patron saints of the whole city. And um, that's why they love them. So I'm just going to show you a few of the many pictures that you could find in Cologne or whatever. The arrival in Cologne, I'll show you that because in the background where I have the arrow, you see the Irish monastery depicted St. Martin. And next to it, the thing with the crane on top, is actually the cathedral. Oh. The cathedral wasn't finished until the 19th century. It had a crane on top since 1400 something. <laughs> and the only reason it was finished was when the Prussians, the Protestant Prussians, took over the Rhineland. They and the emperor was a Gothophile, and, and a medievalist, and it gave the money to finish the Catholic cathedral which, as they thought, it would have looked like in the 13th century. And here we see them on the board. In the background now, you can see already the Basilica of St. Ursula. You can see the Pope is there, the Bishop is there, and the men is there, and the likes of that. The Huns are there with their arrows. Um, this one is another one. The Pope is absolutely aghast, and one of the Huns is about to cut off the head, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I could have shown you much more gory pictures. But, and here, I mean, no painter could just not, I mean, look at all the, the heads rolling everywhere, you know. Yeah. And this one is um, of, you can see that, that all the 11,000 are lying on the floor with the heads off. And, but Ursula is being trans pierced by an arrow. And this is a wonderful one if you're ever in Venice, as you would be. There is in the gallery, in the Acad Academia, a whole walls and walls and walls of um, the, the story of St. Ursula by Carpaccio. You couldn't get it any better than there. So now what is really behind the story? What really happened? 
and it all goes back to this Roman inscription um, called Climatius, which is still in the church of St. Ursula. And I've written out the Latin for you for your perusal, but to make it short, at the bottom it says that in the early fifth century, there was a tradition of the martyrdom of virgins. It says here, the martyrdom of the heavenly virgins. It doesn't give a number or why they died or so. And that there was a church dedicated to these martyrs, which by the fifth century had already fallen into disrepair. And this Roman man, Clementius, was, Crescentius was urged in a vision to restore the church. That's all we have. And then when they were excavating in the monastery after it had been burned in the church, they found this one only gravestone, a single gravestone. And it says here, in this tomb rests the innocent virgin named Ursula. She lived eight years, two months, and four days. So she had hardly have been one of those 11,000 ready to get married or something. But still, the name, the martyr, the virgin, Ursula, was on the spot. And I have eight years. Eight years. So what's interesting is that I still haven't found out what the, the significance of the name Ursula, because it means little female bear. So was it actually a pet form? Rather, my little Ursula, like my little pet or my little sparrow or whatever, that it wasn't real. the real name. It was just, uh, so we don't know that. So how did they get from no number of the virgins to 11 or 11,000? So it is thought that there was another gravestone stone somewhere on which there was written in Latin, as you can see here, that would be X, Y, M, V, 11 martyred virgins, but it was read wrong by why it said 10, 1, 11 million virgins, the M for million or thousand, thousand 11,000 virgins, so that it was originally actually 11, and that would tie in with the fact that with Ursula there would have been 12, so there would have been female disciples, brides of Christ, so that number would make sense. And then somebody read it wrong, or, as we will find out, had a bright idea. So in the fourth century, we know there was a, a, a Roman church, and in the fifth century, it was restored by our man, that there must have been an inscription somewhere. In 922, um, this, this church was run by canons of men of St. Augustine. In the 10th century, the archbishop introduced female canonesses, and from then on, it was in female hands. And the canonesses of St. Augustine were all aristocratic, well-educated, rich women. They were the sisters or whatever relatives of the rich families who didn't marry and went into the monastery. They had, as canonesses, as opposed to nuns, Benedictine nuns, they could keep them their riches, their money. They had servants, they had carriages. <laughs> they lived a great life. If they didn't like it there anymore, they could get out and get married. And I have just a, book, a, a paper in a book which is going to be published in, from Glenstar. There was a conference um, in Glenstar about the Brides of Christ, how in the 12th century there were Irish canonesses of the O'Brien Kings of Torment in Bavaria and Regensburg. And again, they were um, independent aristocratic women. So the, they took over in the 10th century, the women, and then they started this legend. That is the first time it is put into <laughs> writing. But they might have then changed 11 to 11,000, but more likely it happened in 1106 
when this city wall was extended and they suddenly found out that they were on a huge Roman cemetery and suddenly there were bones everywhere. They found as many bones as anything. And interestingly, they must have known already that some of them were women, the skulls, others were men, some were children. That's how they came up with the fact that the Pope came, the bishop came, all of those were all martyr too. So there was not only 11,000, there were now more bones than you could ever think of. So then another passion was written and they didn't know what to do with all their bones and skulls. So they outsourced them to the Benedictine monastery across the river, St. Heribert, where the monks set about to write on, titularly on, on um, marble stones, names. This, she's one of the virgins and also encased the head the heads, and the reason they have always been depicted as being de decapitated is because they had so many skulls, like here. So they did that, the monks there, and they did a great job for them. And um, then they were trying to look for the names of those virgins. And even before Ursula is mentioned, there's a whole load of other ones mentioned. One of them you'll be glad to is St. Brigida. So St. Bridget was one of them too. And uh, suddenly in 1164, as we shall see, it all stopped. So anyhow, I was telling you about the, um, the different versions of the reading, but why did the canonesses, why did the women, the sisters do it? Because they set up then their claim for the preeminence over the other churches those miserable 349 <laughs> so-and-so, but they could also relate to them with personal experiences because they might have been wanted to be married and didn't want to marry, but rather be a nun. And so it was in a way a bit of a Brides of Christ, a white martyrdom, um, also political expediences, money was coming in, fierce, they could build their new Gothic choir, they could do everything. But it connected them, the community, and it was called the mystique of the sisterhood. All these nuns, all these convents who had the relics in Spain, in Galway, would have been part of this community of the 11,000 and these, these, these months. So, but in 1106, when they found themselves on a huge graveyard, they had, as it said here, 11,000 skulls, 22,000 legs, and 222 fingers and toes available. I mean, it's like winning the Euro lottery. They thought at the time, they didn't know what to do with, with all their stuff. So as I said, some of them they outsourced, but other ones they kept in the church. So in the 15th century, they still claimed they had the whole body of Ursula because she was not decapitated. Um, and they built a sarcophagus for her there. But later on, then they relented and they put their heads up anyhow in two wonderful reliquaries, as you can see there. But the virgins left and right got um, head busts, the reliquaries which are now everywhere in Spain and in their dozens in Cologne and everywhere. And they have all this enigmatic Cologne smile, as they call it, to this day. And you can see that it, all of them have this opening in front um, where the hand, you could put a hand in and rub the relic. And as Barra O'Donovan has found out when he examined our skull here, on the left hand side, the skull is of a young woman. It was buried in earth. They found bits of earth in it. It was cleaned out. Um, and on the left hand side, it's rubbed off. So people must have rubbed it as the rub of the relic before it ended. So all of these would have had that. 
and we just see there was a craze now for those heads. And in the 13th century, a Dominican monk from Sweden wrote to his Dominican friends in Cologne to said to keep some of the heads for us. They were going at fierce prices at this stage. So in the year after, he went there and he bought 10 of them. And he thought, as Weiner shows with the true cross, that uh, the relics helped him to cure him of heart disease. So maybe we could start a little business there with the heart disease. But he then sent back nine of the heads to Sweden, and he traveled back with one of them suspended around his neck. So everywhere now you go in Cologne, you see those smiling virgins. And the Cologne people are naturally very fond of them. Also, they told us that ever since the 11,000, they haven't had many virgins there since, and they didn't come up in the census either lately, the last one. So they have this smile about them, and you could recognize them anywhere you go. But what happened then? At the same time, when our reliquary was made, the nuns, the sisters in St. Ursula, after having sent over already barrel loads of bones to the other monastery, they were still stuck with 200,000 toes or whatever. So not only do they have in what they call the golden chamber, 120 of those busts, 670 additional skulls, and we think we're doing well with one here, you know and other bones. So in the long winter evenings, they started to embroider the walls with bones. So, I mean, we know in convents they used to do needlework or, or, or lace, but these nuns obviously um, loved a bit of, I, you can just imagine them sitting there and one saying, can you pass me another femur, please, or something? <laughs> and um, then they knitted them up, and the whole wall is full of bones there. And um, it's the most most macabre thing. Where was I that you have ever seen? I go back. The whole walls up to the top are, and they spell out uh, invocation, pray for me, St. Ursula, and, and so on. So um, you... You can go and view them now. And, and anybody for your med, med tech exhibition, you could identify where the different bones are, are coming from here. Um, and as I said to you, in 1164, suddenly, all this enshrinement of the relics stopped. Why? Because in 1164, the Archbishop, uh, Archbishop of Cologne, who happened to be the imperial chancellor, brought the relics of the three magi, the holy, the holy kings from Milan, which the emperor had sacked at the time he fighting against the northern um, Italian cities. The people in Milan didn't even know they had the relics of the three magi until in, they appeared in Cologne. So that's another story. But, and uh, as I said, I, I gave this lecture in, in, in Cork because Cork is actually twinned with Cologne, which few people in Cork know, nobody in Cologne knows. But we had the German ambassador there to 30 years of twinning. So I'm sorry, Galway can't come into the Cologne connection anymore. <laughs> so their three wise men arrived in Cologne in 1164. And as every woman in the audience knows, it's hard enough to find one wise man. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm prepared to suspend belief with the 11,000 virgins, but three wise men. <laughs> so the three wise men, we're all um, relic, their relics are in there. They haven't moved, nothing has been given away. They became the 
focal point of pilgrimage from then on and still are. That's where they go on the 6th of January and the Virgin were kind of put to the side. But they're stuck in there, whereas our have the triumphal march. Not only did Christopher Columbus name the Virgin Islands after them, Ferdinand Magellan named Cape Cap Virginis because he actually discovered it on Ursula's feast day, the 21st of October. And then it's for Spanish and Portuguese conquistadors, the discovery of the Americas meant not only colonization, but also evangelization. And with the joining of Spain and Austria, as we saw, there was an enormous repository of relics. And they, virgins could be used to meet the demands of the innumerable churches that needed to be founded and built in the new world. So in Amer South America and everywhere, there are the relics of the virgins. They are everywhere, and the three wise men are stuck in Cologne. <laughs> so, so there you can some of, some of the examples of the skulls as they did them in Cologne and very similar to what we have here. The way they embroidered, put the, the skull on a cushion with, um, with pearls around it and the same kind of shape as our reliquary there. So one would assume these are all in Cologne still. So the inspiration could have come either from Cologne, Flanders, or the, um, hundreds of them are in Spain. So just to the last, my last night, so for the Dominican sisters in Galway, the relic of Ursula must have meant a, a special meaning because it was um, indicative of the sense of the community and the fact that all the women that were the sisters of the Dominican sisters were daughters of the tribes of the rich and important people. They had a self-confidence that expressed itself in the reliquaries and all the things that we saw that they could actually commission these expensive silver things. And for them, it enforced the feeling of the sisterhood. And it was then in Cologne as it was in Galway in 1723, a political statement. We are somebody try to outdo us. We are the best kind of thing. So I'm glad now that the descent, the, the present day community of the Dominican sisters still show this sign of um, we are somebody. So that's the end of my lecture. <laughs>